Thank you so much for inviting me to participate virtually in the 2016 Salt Spring Community Energy Conference, where so many of you have come to learn about the exciting things happening in the energy world. I know that for most people, all that energy means to them is when the bill comes in the mail for their electricity or their gas. So it's very exciting to share about the greater possibilities uh, about renewable energy and community renewable energy with you today. It's also very meaningful to be having this conversation in a place where community solar has already happened. I know that many of the members of this audience um, helped to make the solar scholarship array on the roof a reality. So before I begin, I did want to introduce myself. My name is John Farrell, and I work at a small nonprofit organization called the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. I'm in our Minneapolis, Minnesota office. And for 40 years, we've worked to help communities build and use the authority to maximize the capture of their human and natural resources. In energy, it means that we've studied the economics and the policy to enable the greatest capture of local power in both meanings of the word. That's why I direct what we call our Energy Democracy Initiative. So enough about us. What I wanted to start with is to say that you're not the only islanders that are interested in greater energy self-reliance. Last December, we released a report about Hawaii highlighting their relentless focus on reducing their reliance on imported oil uh, to be burned for electricity. And to the Northwest, Kodiak Island and other communities in Alaska are exploring community-based microgrids, almost entirely powered by wind and solar energy. But all of these discussions are taking place uh, in the context of an enormous transformation happening in the utility system. And understanding this transformation is crucial to understanding the opportunity. So let's start with a question. How many of you have a smartphone? Now, I won't be able to see you putting your hand up, but go ahead and do it because it will help your neighbors understand this question. And the second part is keep your hand up if your phone was manufactured by your landline phone company. So unless your landline phone company in British Columbia is a real surprise, the answer, of course, is that most people got their smartphone from somebody else. And this story of innovation from the outside is very similar to what's happening in the utility business. For decades, our only method of making electricity was either burning things or splitting atoms to make heat, to make steam, and to turn turbines to generate electricity. Or if we had big swaths of farmland that we could flood, we could use rivers and gravity uh, to turn turbines. But no matter the technology, the basic philosophy of power generation was the bigger, the better. And the scale economies uh, from this bigger uh, is better philosophy helped lead to the monopoly structure of the utility business, much like we had with landline phones. And it also meant massive power plants that could enti power entire small cities. It also meant very little iteration and learning. And a great example of this is if you're going to bake a cake, but you're only going to do it once every five to ten years, it's going to take you a very long time to perfect that recipe. In contrast to the large and plotting nature of our historical electricity system, today's system is humming with innovation. Distributed solar, for example, can, cap can capture rays from the sun just about anywhere and is getting cheaper every day. And in the U.S., a new, uh, a new distributed solar array is being installed every 60 seconds. That's a lot of learning happening from manufacturing to financing to installation and happening very quickly. Distributed computing is putting the power of power in the hands of everyone. So my smartphone can change the thermostat at my home uh, from anywhere as long as I have an internet connection. Even my 67 year old mother has a smartphone app that she can use to manage uh, the heat tape on her roof that can melt the ice dams in the winter. And all of these smart devices have software that can be updated regularly to add even more functionality or a simpler interface. Energy storage is also fundamentally changing the electricity business by allowing us to store energy for when we need it most or to support the grid from the bottom up. Batteries, for example, are iterating remarkably fast in consumer electronics like smartphones and electric vehicles or even in building microgrids. So all of this iteration and changing, uh, it, uh, iteration and technology and innovation is happening uh, again in contrast to what has traditionally happened in the larger electricity system. And these new technologies are changing that electricity system in unimaginable ways. Take Minster, Ohio. It's a small town, uh, maybe about four to 6,000 people uh, in Ohio that recently decided to build a solar array through their municipal utility. That solar array will provide almost 10% of the annual electricity needs of that town. But the reason the economics worked was because they were able to add a battery to that system that will sell services to the grid. So it's not just serving their town, it's serving the larger grid and their town at the same time. In Hawaii, as I mentioned before, over 15% of households have a rooftop solar array because it was cheaper than getting electricity from the utility. And the Rocky Mountain Institute predicts that home and business users uh, will be able to beat utility prices nearly everywhere in the next 20 years by combining rooftop solar and batteries. 
In short, energy monopoly is giving way to energy democracy. So there are two big implications of this shift. The first one is that utilities that are planning new power plants had better think twice, because the new distributed power tools uh, that customers can control may make their large-scale plans obsolete. If the Rocky Mountain Institute is right with their prediction that home and business users in the next 20 years can beat utility prices on their own, that's going to be within half the lifetime of most new power plants that customers will have a cheaper alternative. So utilities should think twice. And the second big implication is that the rules of the electricity system should allow individuals and businesses to use their own money to improve the efficiency of the electricity system, whether that's through rooftop solar or community solar or building microgrids. A perfect example, of course, is community solar. It captures the capital investment of a community to serve its own energy needs uh, it, and to do so locally. It captures economies of scale in power generation. It can allow renters and low-income people to, a chance to slice their energy bills without having to have a lot of money up front or to own their own roof. Community solar is being talked about a lot. The Rocky Mountain Institute just released a study suggesting that community solar is the thing to be pursuing because it can allow so many people to participate and can compete favorably on cost with large-scale solar arrays. But in most places, unfortunately, the rules so far inhibit the kind of intelligent and economic investment uh, from community-based renewable energy. In particular, customers generally aren't allowed to share electricity from a facility they own in common among themselves. The good news is there are some exciting exceptions. In University Park, Maryland, for example, 35 residents pooled their resources to install a solar array on a local church. They sell the power to the church, and between the combination of that power sales and renewable energy incentives, they've repaid 60% of their initial investment within the first five years. In Minnesota, there's a new state law that has, allowed, uh, has required utilities to allow solar sharing, and it's leading to an explosion in development of community solar projects where customers of the state's largest utility can subscribe to a share of a solar garden and reduce their energy consumption and their energy costs. And all across the Northeast, community solar buying cooperatives are helping many individuals and businesses buy solar together and driving down the price by as much as 25%. The good news is that 16 US states do have a policy, sometimes called virtual net metering or community net metering or just community solar, that is encouraging community solar development. And with the excitement building in those states, other states are considering policies too. Driven by ordinary citizens like you, Connecticut and Maryland recently adopted policies to support community solar. There's good reason to advocate for change. Community-based energy isn't just a feel-good symbol. It helps avoid losses on the transmission system by generating power close to where we need it. Solar energy, in particular, overlaps really well with peak energy use for most utilities. And of course, having more local power generation means keeping more of our energy dollars within our communities. So I want to take a break for a second from that big picture and just talk about what I like to call the top 10 reasons for community solar, uh, a series of slides uh, and principles that we released uh, late last year. The first one, of course, is this issue of community power, that owning a share of a community solar rate is the first step for you and your community to take control of your energy future. The second reason for community power is equity, that it means you can own solar without being rich or having a great credit score, that everybody will have a chance to participate. The third reason that we love community solar is competition, because most utilities are monopolies and community solar offers people an, op an alternative and a choice in the way that they procure their energy. The fourth reason we love community solar is control, because your electric utility can't raise rates on energy systems that you own. The fifth one is jobs. Every megawatt of solar creates up to 20 jobs in the local economy, and community solar is almost always built in the local community. The sixth reason is local dollars, that spending a dollar on community solar electricity means you don't have to pay for mines or fracking or pollution from fossil fuel resources. The seventh reason is ownership. The community solar means that you own a share of your energy future, and it might come from a library or a school rooftop near you. The eighth reason is access to all. Over half of US households don't have a sunny rooftop, but they could own a share of a community solar array. And I'm sure the numbers are very similar uh, for Canadian residents. The ninth reason is clean, reliable energy. With a 25 year war warranty on most solar arrays, solar means you get free and clean energy from the sun for decades. And the 10th reason is savings, that every one kilowatt share of a community solar project can cut your electricity bill by 13% or more. 
in most of the states that have implemented good policies. So I want to close by saying that the utility system, as I mentioned, is undergoing a historic transformation and the new technology of distributed electricity generation is putting power in the hands of people like you. You may just need to tweak the rules a bit to make it happen.